Hello, I'm sitting here talking with Greg from All American Comics in Youngstown. How are you doing, Greg? I'm good, Roger. How are you today? Good, good. Now, you have uh, two stores yes. in, the, in the Youngstown area. Correct. Uh, how long have you been in business? Uh, 27 years yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Happy anniversary. Thank you. And 22 years out in Boardman this July. This is the first week without new new comics. First time since 2010 or 2009. What happened 2009? They had a skip week between oh. Christmas and New Year's because I went to Seattle for that week. And that was the first time in a long time there hadn't been books out in a week. I can't even remember what it was before that, but it's been literally 10 years since we've had a week where no new comic books came in. Right. Well, now they're talking. This is going to be the whole month of April, theoretically, the next four weeks. And how, and with no business coming in, what are you doing to try to draw business into the store? Because you obviously still have rent, you have employees. I still have three employees. Um, you know, at first they said they were going to shut us down for two weeks, which would have been the end of next week. But talking uh, with John from Carolyn Johns, he thought. We were looking at at least a month, which I told him I thought he was probably right. And uh, now it looks like it's going to be a total of six weeks. But, I mean, we got our books last week, and we're ordered to close on Tuesday, so we didn't even get one last Wednesday for all the regulars to come in and buy their stuff, which would have been nice. But um, with only one week's worth of books here, plus whatever might have been laying around from the couple weeks previous, it... I'm not at a desperate mode of alternate forms of retail right now. I mean, if somebody called me and said, hey, I've got like $30 in books laying there. Can you send them to me? I sent a kid's books out to Greenfield, PA today. Um, I mean, all of our stuff last week between Diamond and uh, Alliance and some of our other gaming stuff, we got in like $4,000 worth of stuff approximately. So I have... $4,000 worth of stuff between here and the other store that we got in last week that I haven't had a chance to sell. But after that, nothing new's coming in. So, all what I got your weekly, what would, on the weekly average, what are we looking at? 10000 a week between both stores? Spending or? or uh, from Diamond? No, I'm nowhere, no, I, nowhere near that for us. We're, we're closer to like 3000 to 3500 between both shops, which is still. You know, 175000 that we spend with them every year. So, but I mean, we also get in, I'm saying in total expenditures for rent, utilities, my employees, uh, product, yeah, we probably do spend nine to 10000 a week on everything. Right. But considering all I got to worry about now is utilities. And the guys who work for me, I haven't crunched the numbers yet, but it's significantly lower. I own the building here at the Warren store, so I don't have to pay rent for that. I had to pay rent for my other store today, so I went and did that. And then last week, I paid off every invoice, even if they were 30 days net, and I just got the invoice. Everything's paid up, ready to go. So, I mean, as long as this doesn't, a month's going to be tough. Um, but we've been open, like I said, 27 years. Uh, we've got a lot of back issues here. I mean, obviously we'll run some type of sale when we reopen, but, um, you know, other than that, it's unprecedented. So there's nothing I could even compare it to. Exactly. This is a whole different model. Um, and with the Diamond, now, I've been reading articles, they're talking about how money-strapped they are. You know, I don't think people realize how week to week Diamond distributor was. We always thought Steve Jeppy had all this money and all this stuff, but yet the comp, you know, right. they're talking being, they're talking they may not even survive this. Steve Which, Steve owns part of the Baltimore Orioles, so he's not personally hurting for money, but I'm sure he'd like his comic book distributor to be, and he also owns Alliance Games too. You know, they bought them out whatever it was, five, six, seven years ago. I, I'm sure they'd rather be self-sufficient, but you know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm guessing Steve's got to be worth two or three hundred million. 
being a minority owner in a professional sports team, but I'm sure he doesn't want to write checks out of his own personal checking account to keep this stuff afloat. But if, you know, if no product's coming out, it's not like there's expenses incurred. You know, it's just depending on what's in the warehouse. Or, you know, maybe there are a few things coming in in the next couple weeks, obviously, but we just got in previews last week. I don't even know if I need to fill it out for next month, you know, for two months. So, I mean. Yeah, because we don't know how the order's going to be, because now we have a, a whole month of no books coming out. Are they just going to start then, say the books start again the first week of May, is it going to be this last week's books or just going to be, it just kind of just basically skip a whole month? Right, your guess, your guess is as good as mine. I, I would probably think the first month back to two months, they would have whatever was lined up this month. And then maybe upping the weekly orders 20 to 25% to try to catch up. That's pure speculation. I have no idea if that's how it's going to be or not. But that's probably how it will be to some regard. I, you know, I can't see them going, all right, the first week of May we're back. You get all of your April books in one one shipment, yours fifteen thousand dollars, and you're like, what? Yeah, I'd be amazed if they have four weeks worth of books. I guess they're not even printing the books. I'm not sure right. how far in advance do they print the books. You know, do they have two weeks worth of books sitting at Diamond? Do they, you know? Well, it's like when people ask me about producing their own comic book. I'm a retailer. I'm not a. I don't know anything about that side of the business on how to make a comic book or draw a comic book or how to get it published, you know, and I don't know from the distributor side if it's on a week-to-week basis that they print the stuff and then ship it out, or if, like you said, two weeks, I think two to three weeks probably sounds more feasible than trying to do everything on a Tuesday to put out the following Tuesday, because if you have one snafu with the printer or something like that, then what are you going to do? So, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know how to answer that 100% properly, but... Because you, you keep hearing all these stories and rumors. Of course, you don't know what to believe because everything's on a day-to-day basis, essentially, right now. But to say, like, if Diamond did go under, there was talks of DC, you would actually... DC would distribute their own books. The Marvel would distribute their own books. So, and I'm like, so then you would pay shipping to get books from DC, shipping on Marvel? Is that, like, a feasible thing to, from, to order books from every company? Um... Yes and no. I mean, we get charged shipping, obviously, for Diamond. They charge us every two weeks on our invoices. Here's your accrued shipping costs and stuff like that. But, I mean, that's coming from one spot. You know, if I got a company where I only order a half a dozen books from every month, I'm not paying $9 in shipping for $20 worth of comic books. Those will go away. You know, we order enough through... The main guys like DC, Marvel, Image to some extent, Dark Horse, IDW, Boom. I might, if it came to something like that, I would probably just go with one account and order both stores and just divvy it up from there just to save on something like shipping. You know, we spend, when Capital City was still around in the 90s before everything went to Diamond and all the exclusive deals happened, we would drive up to Cleveland and pick everything up. Oh, sure. And then you pay from here to exit 11, well, the term of the uh, exit for the airport, it was like $2 or $2.50, which is now like 5 bucks each way. But you'd have to make that trip 52 times a year where now my shipping for diamonds like six or 7000 bucks, which is probably... Three to four thousand dollars more if I drove up there, picked everything up, and drove back. So I mean, you had to incur that in. It's not like you can, you know, raise the price a quarter on each book here and go. Well, I had to pay for shipping on this stuff. I mean, it's it's a cost that's incurred and you know is expected. But you know, if, if I wasn't ordering at least fifty dollars worth of stuff off of some company that could send stuff out media mail, even though you're not allowed to mail comic books media mail. You know, we'll make do with what it is. I mean, we're not huge accounts, but I mean, we're we're big enough buying power between both stores to right. where you know it would make worthwhile. Where some of these newer guys or guys out in more rural communities, 
who only spend maybe three or four hundred dollars a week on diamond, there's no way they'd be able to pay shipping on six to twelve different publishers and paying direct mailing yeah. on that. And then, what if somebody sends something FedEx or somebody sends something UPS and they show up on different days? You know, it just. Oh, I even think about that. Yeah. Of, because, you know, Diamond, you get your books every, every Tuesday. Yes. You get your books to be put out for Wednesday. Yeah, if everyone, every company would send their own books, who knows when you would get them. Right. And then you would not have to worry about... Then you, then the street date stuff would be... Obsolete. Obsolete. At that, at that point. But then you'd have the bigger retailers going, well, I can pay for overnight shipping. All right. right. I'm, I, I can outdo my competitor by a day or two if I do it that way. And that's... I don't say unfair, but we see that in every other retail. Sure. You know, Walmart's the same way. You know, they sell stuff at a loss just to get people in the door. Right. You know, and they tell the buyers that. And I've had friends that have worked for companies and work, you know, go to those big retailers and they want everything cheaper than what you even make it for just so they can put it out faster. But, I mean, business is business. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, even in the world of comic books, so... Are you worried? Because they talk, uh, there's a theory, not theory, but it's just nature of the beast. If you don't do something for a couple of weeks, you get out of habit. Correct. You know what I mean? Are you worried about that? Being gone, people not buying comics for three, four weeks, and out of sight, out of mind. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a lot of collectors that are just, you know, diehard and will come. But I'm sure you do have clients that you may not see again. Right. Uh, and not just personal uh, habits. I mean, I work seven days a week because I love what I do. I live where I work. And like I tell people, I don't break bricks for a living. I can come down here and BS about comic books and movies and sports or whatever every day if I want as long as I get my actual work done. So not only is it going to be difficult for consumers, it might be difficult for retailers too of any type of stuff to get back into the swing. But yeah, getting back to the customer's we might lose 25% of our customer base because they've moved on to something else even though they really can't move on to something else. I mean, the best thing that Diamond did was after last week saying we're not putting any new books out. So nobody's got an unfair advantage. You know, I had to explain to a lot of my older clientele that doesn't have social media. It's like, look, there's no books coming out. You don't need, you don't need to feel that you have to come in here and pick your stuff up. Right away. You're fine. You're not missing anything. You're not, I'm not going to hand you a box with $800 worth of stuff after six weeks or whatever the case may be. What about the, what about the people that, I mean, I'm just throwing this out here now, people that have stuff that they haven't picked up in a month or so. Maybe, I, maybe stores could reach out to them and say, hey, you have stuff here that you haven't picked up in a month. That'd be new books to them. Yeah, I mean, you see the horror stories. Most of the guys do that around Christmas time after the first of the year. And, you know, they'll show you a stack of books and go, this is how many books hasn't been picked up yet. And you're like, wow. And you don't want that to happen. But, you know, I've had guys over the years come in and go, oh, I haven't been in in like three months. Hey, can you give me a deal on those books? And it's like, that's your fault you didn't come in. That's not my fault. You're getting charged the same as everybody else. You know, don't come in here thinking I need your 75 bucks that you should have paid me three months earlier because for whatever reason you couldn't budget your money properly. Right. Or, or people mostly, most of the time, most stores offer a discount if you have a pull list anyway, right. 10%, 20%, whatever it may be. Right. You know, so they already get a discount anyway if they have a pull list. But, you know, I've had guys in the past do that. I'm like, well, come in, or they'll come in every two months and spend 150 bucks. They're like, oh my God. I'm like, well, come in every week. You know. Yeah. It's $20. It's a lot trying. It's a lot better than budgeting fifteen to twenty than it is one hundred and fifty to two hundred. But right. I still have five or six guys between both stores that spend at least one fifty to two hundred a week on new books. So I feel okay for them. It's just when we get back to all this, did they a keep working? Were they in a field that need to be kept working? And b how much money they got left over. There might be people that just don't recover from this financially on themselves. You know, yeah, this is, it could take six, eight months to recover this financially. Is, this is discretionary income. 
Yeah, so those things stuff. I talked with uh, another guy yesterday uh, in the the, first, the other podcast uh, talking about this is, you know, 2018, 2019, people were really, the economy was, done, was, was really well, was right. really booming over the last couple of years. People had disposable income. I do a lot of shows, you know. Now, how many right. conventions do you do a year? Six to eight. I don't do a ton like yeah. some of these guys, but I I do shows because I want to, not because I need to. Hmm. You know, I don't have to set up at a show two to three times a month because our store sales are good enough to where I don't have to quote hustle that much. Sure. I mean, we do still put on Youngstown Comic Con, which is looking more and more like we'll have to cancel, and that's a that's basically a year long process too, but. I know there's guys that buy stuff from Diamond with express consent to sell it at shows because they know they can't sell it through their stores. You know. But, uh, but I, I feel bad the, for them because where are they going to pawn this stuff at? Right. You know? Yeah, I know there's a few dealers here that just, just do shows. They don't have a store. They just right. do conventions. And they're like, there's no conventions for three, four. I'm, yeah, I was looking forward to making five, six grand this weekend. Sure. And now, like, that's money I don't have. You know, and they don't have a backup store to back that up. But, um, as I've been talking, you know, I do a lot. I do, you know, I do a lot of shows. I do thirty, you know, forty shows a year between comics, horror, toys, sure. And I talk to no, but I do so many shows. I know a lot of the dealers, and I talk to them, and they'll say, "Oh, this is the best show I've done all year. I did more money this year than last year." People were spending money. People had that disposable income, but now thanks to what's going on now, people may not have right. that disposable income. And let's be honest, comic books is as great as they are and as fun as they are. This isn't a necessity. Not at all. I mean, this January and February at both my stores were the best months for January and February that we've had in five to seven years. I checked old, you know, like, sure. wow, February was pretty strong. Now, part of that's the economy, and also part of it is I attribute to three inches of snow for the last four months. The weather's nice. If there's ten inches of snow on the ground, people aren't coming out and shopping. They'll buy stuff online. But with us having barely any snow since, what, Thanksgiving? We have saw, I won't, I don't like throwing around the word record sales, but I mean, some of the best sales we've had. Right. Even March was good. I mean, a lot of these guys, they have sales for like tax time or whatever and that. I don't need to put my stuff on sale because we were selling stuff at full price. There's, right. you know, there's no reason for me to incentivize a hundred dollar comic book and selling it for sixty bucks when I still got guys giving me a hundred bucks for it because the money was there. Right. Well, you remember like a, a CT week two was end of February, early right. March. Ninety thousand people in Chicago over that three four day convention. Ninety thousand people. Yep. And uh, and everyone, I mean, and, and the people were spending. Dealers there said, especially they had in ages yep. and money. I couldn't believe the figures I was hearing. People were spending. Yeah, I mean, everyone. It's all you know relevant to what people have and what they. You know, bring you do more shows than I do. You know, you'll have guys that'll set up with a couple hundred thousand dollars in product, and then you have these weekend guys that'll show up with like three grand and stuff. So to them, three hundred bucks might be good, even though they paid a hundred dollars for a table. Where I know one Golden Age deal I talked to who sets up in New York City at New York Comic Con and all the other big Comic Cons, he's not happy if he doesn't do a hundred grand over the weekend at some of these mega sure. shows, which. Yeah. God, that'd be nice. <laughs> you know, but he's got two, three million dollars in inventory. I mean, it's all relative. Sure. And then you got to, that's what I like about our show is the prices are relatively cheaper than a lot of shows that size, but we have less competition and we bring in more people. So the dealers do make good money there, or at least they should make good money there. And, you know, sometimes these shows outgrow expectations in the way of, how much money you make because they have so much money wrapped up into stars and that, and and people are there with their money spread too thin because oh I can fit another fifty tables in here, well, that's all well and good but if, you know if you upped your dealer tables by twenty five to fifty percent from the year before you better bring that much more people back in, or the guys that had set up when it was smaller and made better money they don't want to make less money because. You really show too big, you know. I've seen a few shows like that where there's more dealers and people, 
in, in you know in retrospect, you know, we're, sure. we're just you know not enough money going around for all the dealers that are there. And, and I've said for years, I go well, last couple of years, I go, I, I you know I do all these shows, you you know you got fifty dealers all trying to sell the same two hundred comics, you know. It's yeah. always the same books you see on every sh- every every uh, you know yep. wall. Oh wow! You have a Spider Man three hundred. Yeah, no, that's you, new. You have an overpriced Spawn number one. You have a Dark Hawk one only because that's the big joke going around. But you know, in the way of like true quality, a lot of these guys have to sell off the good stuff they get from their collections that they get in to help pay for the collection, keep the cash flow going. Right. And you know, they have to. I won't say wholesale, but if you get a collection in, you spend five thousand bucks, and three thousand of it's wrapped up in the Hulk one eighty one. You got to sell the Hulk one eighty one, and then what are you left with? Right, two thousand dollars in common stuff that you might get a grand out of. So that collection you thought you were going to make four thousand dollars on might have went down to five hundred only because you had to wholesale off the best stuff to get the money back, so you can keep paying your other bills. It's it's a it's a vicious cycle. I mean, shows shows are great. And I, I'd like to do more. Physically, I just can't. And then anything more than a... Oh my, I just had dinner and my stomach's grumbling still. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm fat. But, um, you know, I, I like doing good one-day shows and good two-day shows. And there's a lot of good three-day shows out there. But physically, me personally, I, I just can't handle that. Because everyone's like, why don't you set up at Steel City? Well, it's three days and you got to set up on Thursday. So actually, it's four days. Right. You know, Cincinnati's a good show. That's three days. Indiana Comic Con's a three-day show that I heard's really good. That's three days, too. And, you know, but there's a lot of good shows in Northeast Ohio that I go to, so. Right. And then all these shows are going to start packing up or on the same weekends. They're going to start moving. It's going to be, they're already starting. If our show goes off, it is now the same weekend as the moved Indiana Comic Con. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's Indiana. still six hours away, but it's a, that's a big show. Plus, you, know. you have dealers that do both, both shows. shows. Right. So now these well, dealers and, now have to make a decision. And now Teco in Pittsburgh is the same weekend as my show. So I've already lost one vendor that I know of going, look, you know, I'm from over that way. I make a lot of money at the anime shows because she's more of a crafter than a comic book person. So I completely understand. But... Luckily, I haven't put out a lot of money towards my show this year. I haven't paid it, any of the guests or anything like that because we were still working on a guest list. But, I mean, even though we're two months away, things with this going down to May 1st and no free comic book day to push the shows, you know, like every store within four hours, I would send flyers and posters to knowing that they got their biggest crowds coming in in May. And it was just a natural Worked out well. First part of May, and then our shows usually the first part of July. This year is the end of June, so oh look, there's a show coming up. And same with us. I mean, we had we had 500 people show up here for free comic day just at this store, and every book's got a flyer in it. So, it, right. I mean, in the way of marketing, if I can't market my show properly because everything's closed, that I just won't run it, and I'm not going to look in the calendar and go, well, who moved to what and to where. I'll just take a year off. Try yeah. looking like, you know, at that point, that might be the better bet because it you know, I don't want to run a bad you, show because all you need is one bad show and everyone's like, well, that show stinks. Well, his show went downhill, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I could tell people, besides the people we announced, and it's no secret now, we had Peter David lined up, who was in Canton a couple of years ago and they said he was a great guest, but we also had um, Brian O'Halloran coming. And Jeff Anderson, so we had Randall and Dante coming. And Jeff had just started doing shows. He's only done one or two shows he started this year. Right. So we were going to get him pretty much fresh. Right. Because yeah, O'Hanlon has done a lot of shows for the yeah. last, you know, five, ten years. Right. But Anderson just started doing just shows started doing this show. year. And following, you know, us bringing in the comic book men and Jason Muse last year. And they had the same agent. So we're like, hey, Jeff's new. We'll sign him up because... I'd rather bring him in with Brian, because like you said, Brian's done so many shows, but now if I could bring him and Jeff together, then people come out and get everything signed twice, you know, or whatever they want to do, and meet Randall and Dante, you know. And, oh, that would have been great. And Peter David, you know, and then we had Kyle Higgins and Marguerite Bennett. We had a good lineup this year. Yeah, that's and, a strong lineup. I, I don't want to talk past tense. I mean, I can't line up 
15 or 20 guests because I don't have that many people to ballet that many people around. And I don't want the show to turn into, I got to wait in line for six out of the seven hours I'm here because William Shatner's here or, you know, somebody that necessitates a three hour line. Right. I mean, it's fine. There's shows like that. They are great. I, you know, they help with the hobby and all that other stuff, but, you know, I want I want the feel to be more like it was back in the 80s and 90s and stuff before it got glamorized. but it's still, I've got guests to where people who aren't into that stuff still might walk through the door and go, well, i never seen that before. That's kind of cool, you know. And plus, it's fun to people watch. Yeah, and, and you do put on a good <laughs> show. I'm not just saying that. You, know, you really do put on a really good show. And uh, how many dealers do you have at your show, um, on average? We sell 126 tables on the inside, on the main floor, and we have 12 tables for guests. And then in the outside, I put in some of my buddies that are weekend warrior dealers, hmm. and I sell them tables cheaper because they're just usually showing up with stuff. Yeah, yeah, they're on the outside, right. so people don't even know they're even there. Yeah. I know, so I'm like, hey, there's dealers out here. You but, know? <laughs> but I put them on that one side where the aisle's longer, and all the bathrooms are over there, so eventually right. people do find do them. them. Yeah. Plus, we usually have the costume cosplay contest in that corner, too, so people do get there. And But I charge them a fraction of what I charge on the inside. But, I mean, it's... So we've got about 140 tables on the inside, which is a good size show. I mean, it's not 250 or, you know, like some of these guys that are 1,200 booths, but I'm not charging 700 bucks for a booth, either. You know, I mean, it's still... For a retailer, it's 275 bucks for basically an eight-foot table but a 10 by 10 spot. Yeah, that's and a good deal because I mean, you go, because you get a lot of people that show up. Like, what was the attendance the last show? Last last couple of years, we've averaged right around 45, 4800. Hey, strong. Yeah, and that doesn't include, you know, a lot of the dealers buy stuff too. And that doesn't include those, and we probably let in kids are six and under are free. We probably let in two to three hundred three kids every year. So I tell people 5000 bucks, and that doesn't include the comp tickets that I have to give to Valley or that I send to the mayor of Youngstown and the council people, and then the fire department and the police department, I'll send 10 free passes just to help the service guys, you know. Yeah, that's nice. Um, well, quick last thing here. But there was talk about DC and Marvel doing straight to digital this week, and then they changed their mind. You think they got strong armed by the, the, all the stores? Yes. I don't know that for a fact, but I don't. They know their bread and butter's stores like this, and our local newspaper did an article on myself and a couple of the other local stores talking about that. And it's like I, you know, they've had digital comic books out now for what about a decade or whatever. I've lost one guy to that that I know of. Like, hey man, I just get my stuff online. I read it. That's cool, you know. But guys, forty and over, they'd rather hold. They want to hold the book. That's the whole thing about these. This medium is not only it, it's not like reading a book on a Kindle, but the artwork is much as the story in some cases, and vice versa. And the coming together of a great story and great artwork is much better being held in your hand than swiping right on a Kindle or something to read a regular book on. Now, I'd heard there were talk of, of this, where DC and Marvel, it's not mostly DC and Marvel, they're the, obviously the big two, that they would give you specific codes, and you, as the store, would sell those codes to to the customer. And then they would lo log in that code into the whatever website and get their right. book. Uh, I read about that, but I didn't really read, read it, and I don't know how legitimate that was going to be. I think it was just an idea thrown but out there. But if we there, can't but... sell the things, if they can't come into the store, then how do we get them to them? Because all you need to do is email one person, and then they wind up on some site. It's like, here's all the comic books you can read for free. So I think policing that is difficult. And, you know, I give these guys credit for we're not going to put out codes until we put out the physical comic books. That's the way it should be. You know, at least in my opinion, you know, I'm not... You know, 27 years ago when I was 26 when I opened, I might have had a different opinion if the technology now was like it was back then and I had grown up more on that stuff. You know, I was 30 
3031. Well, my eBay name's Hammer31, so I've been doing my nickname in high school is Hammer for some reason. And that 31 was my age when I started eBay. I'm 53 now, so I've been doing eBay for 22 years. But, I mean, a lot of things have changed. What if I was only seven years old back then and I'm 29 now? My whole perspective's got to be different because I'm an old school dinosaur, just like, you know, a lot of these guys. But, I mean, if you look around all of northeastern Ohio, most of the guys that deal in magic cards and gaming and stuff, they're the 35 and under crowd. But we've been doing that since day one or two. And most of the uh, comic book stores slash game stores, if they're predominantly comic books, they're all guys my age or a little older or maybe a little younger. But the fly-by-night outfits from the 80s or from the 90s and 2000s where you thought if you open up one box of magic cards, you can own a store or a box of baseball cards, you could own a store. They're gone. You know, but you got to give it up. You know, I don't want to say okay, boomer, but because I'm Gen X, thank God. I'm not a boomer. Um, you know. That's something a boomer would say. That is something a boomer would say. Yeah, you're right. But I mean, you look at like John from John and Carol's. He's a couple years younger than I am. Bill's a couple years older than I am, but we're all in the same demographic. John Haynes is a couple years older. Same way with Jimmy up at Comic Heaven. John from Ken Moore is a little bit older than I am. JC, he's my age, maybe a year or two younger. You know, I'm just thinking off the ones off the top of my head. Um, so, I mean, we've been around. There's a lot of stores that you can go, wow, this store's been around 20 years or more, but there's not many stores where you go, well, this guy's only been open a couple of years. Because usually after a couple of years, they don't make it, you know. There's a few out there, you know. Um, Some have. Down in Akron, there's a, the sure. one store, uh, Hazel, the, you know. Oh, yeah, John, yeah. Um, I, I feel bad for um, Rubber City. Uh, they just, them, they the just bought that store. You know, I mean, they just opened uh, or took over that store sure. a few months ago. I don't, you know, and they got to be hurt. This is going to be killing them. I mean, same way uh, Joe Universal sold his store in Canton, so... I know they pretty much went to all gaming, but still, you can't game. I mean, you're not allowed in a store, and you're not even allowed to sanction events. So what are these guys doing? You know, I've diversified to where we're a good magic store, we're a real good back issue store, we have new comic books, we do, you know, we do, I can't live off of selling t-shirts and posters, but they're there. We've got plenty of graphic novels. Um, I mean, I'm glad I jumped on the CGC train a couple years ago. I know a lot of people don't like them, but I can tell you right now, it's easier for me to sell a graded book on eBay right now in these times than it is an ungraded book because this is this is the grade and let's negotiate price from there right. as opposed to can you send me a picture of the front, the back, each corner, you know, the centerfold, the staples, and you're sitting there going it's 20 bucks, dude, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um now you worry because I think now I'm one of the people that don't like graded books outside of maybe something to keep it nice and preserved right. if you have a key. But people get like you know the new book that came out last week they get graded and they might charge two hundred dollars. That's, that's these ridiculous. guys that buy new books and then get like Stan Lee to guys like that to sign it thinking they're you know those books aren't going to be worth anything in ten years. I can tell you that right now. You know I got the you know some of these Facebook things of like you know modern books with signatures i'm like go ahead or even just the stuff you see like something like something out there called stabby bunny i don't even know what this is yeah but they get those they might charge two three hundred dollars i'm like what is this this is garbage i don't even know what this is yeah everyone thinks they're going to find the new turtles or the you know whatever the case yeah be. but in terms of uh, graded books you know definitely the golden age stuff right you know i mean stuff like that to keep preserved and keep nice and right. old books but there's new stuff but even so, I think some of those prices are overinflated because, like I said, the last couple of years, we've been cash flowed nice, you know, right. in terms of the you know, in terms of the, envi uh, the environment, the, the economy has been great. Last year, my 401k did better than it had in the 20 years that I've had one. And I'm sitting there going, why didn't I cash in these comic books and make 25% on that stuff? I mean, obviously, being a comic book dealer, I think of, you know... Well, this book's going to be worth now, and what it's going to be worth in ten years. But are you worried about this next year? Because again, I think people are going to be less cash heavy. Where they, like people may not, they may, if you know, may, may bit, pull the trigger on a three hundred dollar book, four hundred dollar book, thousand dollar book. Right. They may not have that extra money. 
because this is going to hurt people for, it may only be a month or two, but everyone's car payment, rent, right. if they have kids. I mean, I've got guys that have books on hold that make payments, you know, and I've had one guy's like, hey, I can't send you 200 every other week like I was. Gonna, I don't care. You know, send me what you can. We'll get through this. It's fine. I mean, we've we've been busy enough to where it could go a year and I still want I still wouldn't have to close I mean I've got uh, that's with paying my employees too and my rent well we'd be we're fine you know I don't know the cash situations for some of these other guys or even in some of the guys that have been around for 15 20 25 30 years you know my divorce was 22 years ago and I'm you know I'm through that and past that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah but I it's just one of these deals where it's it's going to really test the metal of some of these guys as businessmen. It really and is. And how they've done business. And I how know. they've done business because they might have to change the way they do business now because the money's not flowing. It's like, what are you going to do now that, say, your orders go down 30%? I, I remember when people were like, I can't believe they canceled Walking Dead and Saga. Where How are we going to make that money up? And I'm like, I don't know how many copies of that a month you were selling, but even if it was 50, you're only looking at 150 bucks. Right. I mean, that's, that's me going out for sushi with a friend. You know, it's like... Uh, well, there might be a thing in terms of saying, like, this book is, is hot. People buy Walking Dead, and it was a great book. Yep. That brought people into the store. There are people out there that only read Walking Dead. You know, that, that was a big book. For, I mean, that was but, a... It went on whatever, right. 200 issues. Great, great point. You know, we had more people come in for that property than any other property we've ever had. And, I mean, there were guys that have been shopping here since 1993 in the late 2000 zeros wanting to know if they put out a Walking Dead comic book yet after season one. Like, it started in 2003. These guys were comic book guys and didn't even know that there were books put out. But I've never had as many people come in going, hey, I like the TV show. What, what can I get? Here's a $10 trade to start you off with. Plus, we give you 20% off. Eight bucks. And it's just like heroin then. They'd come in and buy every trade. But since it was canceled, done. We haven't had... Between both stores that I know of, like, anyone coming in randomly going, hey, do you got Walking Dead stuff? Just hadn't, you know. And, I mean, we still had stacks of the last issue because we ordered so heavy on them. And we made money on it, obviously. But it's just, what's the next thing going to be, comic book-wise? I mean, even the Watchmen TV show, you know, regardless if people liked it or not, it was popular. And... Hey, you, you sell a couple Watchmen trades here and there, but how many people buy them on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever the case may be? But, you know, the biggest the biggest stuff to help bring people in that aren't into comic books are the lesser-known properties. Because everyone knows who Superman and Batman is. They can put out the best Batman movie ever next week, and nobody's going to run in here and go, Hey, you got anything on this Batman guy? But it's like Walking Dead... Sin City, when it, that first movie came out, because the second one was garbage, and 300, and Hellboy. There were guys that came in here didn't know Hellboy as a comic book. I'm like, he started in 1994. Right. Really? Yes. <laughs> here, try some of the trades. <clears throat> you know, even V for Vendetta, great movie, brought people in, but nothing was like Walking Dead. But, you know, even as good as the Marvel movies have been in the last year, couple years, we might have sold an extra couple Infinity Gauntlet trades. But everyone had been collecting since the early 90s. So everyone has that book. Or knows of that book. Yeah. Well, you think a lot of the, the Avengers, I know people had talked about it, but when the, the Avengers stuff was real big over the last couple of years, the books weren't that good. And it wasn't even the team in the movie. It was, you know, Marvel at the time was trying to do all that so, 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 social justice warrior stuff. Right. And then changed all the characters around. and it, We lost more people two, three years ago. Just guys like... I'm, I don't like what they're trying to do. I just want to read about the guys that I grew up on. And, I mean, I can see from a publisher and maybe a creative point of view, trying to change stuff up, you know, the Hulk's 
Bruce Banner, it's not Amadeus Cho. Sorry. You know. And... If, well, my thing with the Hulk is, and we're getting into comic yeah. book stuff now, but, there, but if, ev- if everyone's great. a Hulk, if everyone's a Hulk, it ain't special. That's my thing with Thor, too. If everyone can pick up Thor's hammer, and everyone's a Thor, it's not special. <laughs> not at all. I mean, it, as great as, like, even the Guardians movies were, it's not like people come in and we're like, I want to read that Guardians comic book. I still sell less than ten copies between both stores. You know, and arguably, Guardians 1... At least to me, is a top five or six Marvel movie of the last ten years. That movie's phenomenal. I'm, number two's growing on me, you know. And my guys laugh because I'm a big list kind of guy, and they're like, "Why, why don't you rate all the movies?" I'm like, well, "I don't know which each one of them is, and, you know, whatever." I'm like, "Quit teasing me and mocking me, you idiots!" But you know, there some of the movies that were great at the box office. They didn't do. Jack squat for us in the way of generating sales. I I wish Marvel or DC one of these days would just put up the comic shop locator service before a movie in one of the trailers or something. Or even at the end of the movie, before they go to the cut scene or the, you know, the... You like Thor? Go to a comic book store. You know, and here's a, you know, visit your local comic shop. Just once. Yeah. You know, could you imagine if they would have done this... For Endgame, just give us the biggest movie of all time and, get, you know, just give us a generic push. Because they, I don't know if they assume or if they don't care because these movies make billions of dollars. They could care less about this, but, you know, without us, this is what yeah. kept that going to where they could be where they're at now. Yeah, they just have to print it just for the properties because they, they'll make a billion dollars on the film. The Avengers may sell, what, 40,000 copies nationwide? Right. You know, I mean... You know, you can actually get the numbers. You go to that uh, Crunchyroll site, and it tells you the orders with diamonds shipped. That's not what's sold in the store. Right, that's shipped. They, they may have sold, they, they may have shipped fifty thousand copies of Avengers. But that doesn't mean they, that means those copies all sold. You know, Marvel's been recently pretty good. They picked the weirdest titles, but they'll overship mm-hmm. us stuff. Here's a free, here's four free copies of this, or five free copies of that, which is okay, but. You could do a lot more for us than give us free stuff to sell for a $4 book. You know, that won't cost them anything at all. Or even have <clears throat> even have somebody in the movie reading a comic book, you know, of whatever the movie might be, just as a gag. You know, or have, you know, when Stan was alive, have Stan sitting there reading a comic book and, like, look up over from the top of it to see what what might be going on in the scene in the movie, you know. But they're not going to capture the magic of this first phase ever again. Right. I don't care who they put out there. They can put out a great Fantastic Four movie. It's not going to be the same as the thing leading up to Thanos. Just isn't going to be, at least I don't think so. You think Marvel, I mean, we're talking, you know, it's almost we're talking, you know, pre-Corona, pre-corona 19 right. and post-Corona, you know. The last year or so, Marvel has been hiring a lot of writers and artists. I don't think are up to par. They hire them based on whether they look like the character. Like, oh, we have a an Asian character. We have to get an Asian writer. You know, this character is a black with a black woman with crazy hair. Well, we have a Marvel character like this. So we have to have her. You know, and then and then they're toxic. They they call if you don't if you don't like something. You know, because it's all interactive on Facebook and Twitter. And if you say something, oh, I don't like this book, or this and that, they call you a racist, and say, well, don't buy the book. It's just this toxic coming out of these writers and artists. I, you I, think that's going to hurt over this next year? I don't like if somebody has an agenda to try to push their agenda on me, even as not being a store owner. You know, let me make that decision. It's up to them to figure out who their target audience is and who butters their bread and make them happy. And if it's a bunch of guys that have been collecting comic books for the last 20, 30, 40 years, and you're not drawing a younger clientele in, then don't think that we want to read and look at the stuff that might appeal to a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old. You know, it's, it's like when you watch the prequels of the Star Wars movies and go, these were terrible... Or compared to the first, you know, New Hope in those, 
And then you, I just read some George Lucas made those movies for basically, not the guys that grew up on Star Wars, but for the same demographic of those guys, that, like my age, I saw Star Wars in the theater when I was 11. He basically wrote Phantom Menace and all those for 11 year old, you know, for kids 8 to 15. And you can tell. Right. And it's like, dude, the backlash would not have been near as bad if you would have wrote these movies for the guys that saw the movie 20 years ago and they're in their late 30s and 40s now. You, A, probably would have put out a better movie, and B, you know, you wouldn't have had to endure the backlash of, man, Phantom Menace stunk, and I think Attack of the Clones might have been worse, but, eh, who knows, you know, and Rise of the Sith, you know, okay, not bad. I, I'm not even getting into these three movies that Disney made. You know, it's like, same way with comic books. The Marvel movies work well because they're not trying to count out a 10-year-old kid. I'd rather see them a little on the PG side. And the R-rated movies they've made have been really good. Because I'm an adult, and not everything's Bugs Bunny. Logan was great. Deadpool was great. You know, even though there was Fox instead of Marvel, but I, I'd like to see more R-rated movies. Yeah, the movies for adults. Because everyone's like, they come in and go, they still make Archie? I've never seen this in a comic book before. Have you looked at one since 1968? <laughs> Not really. Well, it's been 50 years. Things right. progress. Uh, true. But also, I don't mind when they make stuff for kids. Cause kids yeah. need stuff, too. I mean, Star Wars, you know, as much like Star Wars as much as the next guy, but it is, it, it's a kid's movie. Even if you watch you know, A New Hope, you watch it, that's a kid's movie. So I don't mind. You know, they have new stuff, the new, like, Teen Titans Go and stuff. Yeah. I it, mean, those are great, but... It's stuff for kids. Which is I fine. Mean, Kids need cartoons and TV, too. I'm not sure how many guys you're going to interview. You know, I'm sure Bill will tell you the same thing. You know, the amount of... If you put a line at the age of 18, what percentage of his customers come in are over 18 and what come in a, that are under 18, I'm at like 90%. I mean, I, I rarely do we get middle school or high school age kids in here. Really? In the way of reading the comic books. Obviously, they're into different stuff. That well, that's the thing too. We're looking. We're talking when we were younger. We didn't have as much as they have now. Correct. So there's a lot more stuff to get people's interest and in what and whatnot. Whereas, so how do you draw in those new readers? Because essentially, that's what you, basically is what we're talking about is drawing in new readers from that you know 12 to 17 year old to get them hooked on the comics and then get them to be readers and for the next 20 years. That's uh, that's their job, <laughs> you know. They're a lot more smarter and uh, a lot more smarter. That's not even a word. They're they're a lot smarter, and, you know, and they actually have people that look into that kind of stuff, you know, marketing and this and that. You would think, with the popularity of the movies, not just on the Marvel side but on the DC side, and that one of those two companies would have said, "Wow." Yeah, a lot of people to watch these movies. What can we do to use them to help us sell more comic books? I don't think I don't think either one of them. Do, do they care? Do they you care? Know, right. They just have the books as basically as a placeholder to hold the copyrights. You know, whether it might be Superman, Batman, right, Superboy, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Mark you, Adventures, Guardians. Just, just the classification of something being called a comic book movie or a Marvel movie, they still have to go, yeah, this came from this comic book. They come up with their own characters that aren't based off of comic books. It's like people that put out, back in the 90s and 2000s, that were putting out animated movies that weren't from Disney. They were flops. And they weren't just small flops, they were historic flops. You know. Or even some of these fantasy movies. Man, you know, if it's not Lord of the Rings, nobody cares. When they put out John Carter from Mars, I'm like, this could be the best movie ever made. Nobody will care about it because nobody cares about John Carter from Mars. And I've watched the movie two or three times, and it is not good. And it doesn't help. It, it has absolutely no cachet of being an Edgar Rice Burroughs-based book slash movie. Just nobody cares. You can put out a superhero, if he doesn't have a comic book around it, besides The Incredibles, 
you know, just doesn't work. They have to keep us around because it legitimizes their product of being a comic book movie, you know, from Marvel or DC or, you know, even this rebooted Spawn comic movie if it ever comes to fruition. But we'll see. How do you do as a, as a store owner try to draw new customers? I basically tell people, no matter what kind of business you have, if you don't market, you're not going to make, you're not going to be a success. We have, and we used uh, a lot of DC co-op marketing, which they quit at the end of 2019. Oh, did they? I didn't hear that. Yeah. So we have cable TV commercials. We have regular TV commercials. We do radio. Um, some print. Obviously, we do social media. I probably spend three. Well, through the store, we probably do twenty to twenty-five thousand bucks in marketing each year, between all the mediums, and then we do almost near that just for the show. But I don't push the show off as presented by All American Cards and Comics. You know, obviously, people. No, we run the show for the most part because we do put our name and stuff that attached to it. But, you know, I can tell you out of the stores within a half an hour of me, I do infinitely more money advertising than they do because there's a zero. And, I mean, it, you have to have faith in it to be able to put the money into it. You really, you really do. But, you know, I've tried to tell some of these guys that haven't been around that long, use the marketing money because we got 50% back. I mean, the first thing I ever did was like 2011, 2012, one of the, I can't remember if it was iHeart or Cumulus, one of the big guys had a thing where you could get a full year's uh, of commercials on the radio for 50% off. And then after that, using the co-op, I got another 50% off. So basically I got whatever it was, $16,000. No, it wasn't quite that much. Like $12,000 worth of ads. It was like 1000 a month for basically two fifty a month. Just radio. And our sales in the first two years were up 50%. Try to find a company that's been around 20 years at the time and in two years do something and raise their gross, app, gross sales 50%. It doesn't happen. And everyone's like, how'd you do it? And I go, marketing. It really is. You know, plain and simple, I, but I won't, you know, different marketing works for different people. If somebody could write a book or even have a one sheet of this is how you're going to make money, they'd be trillionaires because <laughs> they'd make everybody money and everybody would go to them. But it's, it's an inexact science. But we do a little bit of everything. You know, we had new commercials just made. For the stores, uh, two weeks ago, I don't know when they're going to start in rotation, but, you know, we were using uh, a Watchmen ad for the last year, and it just coincided that the TV show come out, because the before Watchmen stuff took so long, we ran it for a year and a half, and they just, either by design or not by design, the last issue of that came out basically the same week as the last episode of the HBO show. Jeez. So it worked, you know. You guys have Watchmen? Yep, right here. All right, thanks. Now, do you dictate when those commercials air? Um, they send me a schedule. We'll be like, obviously in June, we would have been in heavier rotation because of the show. But they'll send me stuff like, all right, we'll have you on some non-peak, some peak. Um, I'm a big proponent for at least the radio of the overnights. From midnight to 5.59, a lot of these guys will sell you a 30-second commercial for a buck. And once morning drive starts at 6.01, they go to 15 to 20 to 30 bucks. Well, I'll take 50 a week on the weekends and overnights as opposed to 5 during 7 a.m. Mm. rush hour. Because a lot of the, you know, a lot of guys that collect... They're either out late or they're up early. So, and I've had people in Western PA, you know, even had guys from Todd's shop that listen to Hot FM, the you know, the top 40 thing go, 
Yeah, I was sitting in our Elwood store and I heard your commercials over the radio. <laughs> Just turn them up a little bit. You know, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> is what it is. But I mean, it, 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 that nobody, nobody who runs a successful business, regardless if you sell comic books or whatever, if you don't market, you're not. You'll hit a plateau, and that's where you'll stay. So, but, I mean, we do direct mail. We do email. You know, we do a little bit of everything because not everybody is a 28-year-old millennial that's on Twitter or TikTok or whatever is hot for six months. I still have plenty of customers and former customers that are older that, you know, don't even have a Facebook page for whatever reason. Fine. I got to get a hold of you somehow. You know, we do billboards for the show. That was the favorite thing Jason Muse said when he drove in. Dude, I come riding into Youngstown, I see my face on a billboard. I'm like, I've been in ten movies. What are you talking about? He goes, no, that was really cool. I'm like, I go, you were on five billboards, bro- brother, not just one. <laughs> oh, dude, and even when he got interviewed, he's like, yeah, he even brought that up. You know, and I've had people, even like uh, Mark Allen, he's got re- a dealer from Cleveland. He's got relatives that live over in Western PA, came drive through uh, Youngstown three years ago. He goes, was that your billboard I saw for the show? I said, yeah, he goes. Man, that's really cool. You know, and some 12-year-old kid that's not paying attention because he's not driving ain't going to see it. Mom and Dad's going to see it. At least you hope to. Right. Yeah. Well, a lot of stores don't do it, so it's it's special. It stands out. Right. You know, whatever, you know, whatever, you know 40 stores in Ohio, well, you know, I, you're the only one that has a billboard. A lot of these guys think about, I got to get all the comic book collectors to come to my shop. Well, there's only this amount of the general public collects. What about the soccer moms that the kids just want to come and do that? And that's why we market to everybody as just opposed to, well, I know that guy collects books because he goes to this guy's store. That guy's not coming to your store unless the other guy goes out of business. Nobody changes comic book shops unless something, unless you move or they really screw something up for you or you find out that they were selling you recent issues for $50 because they were hot. Nobody, nobody quits. I've heard of that, yeah. So my, they really upset, my you know, theory, upset. my theory for the marketing was, well, I want everybody who's new coming into this hobby want to come to us first. I now put my store and what we carry in both shops and our customer service and our prices and all that other good stuff up against anybody and let people make an educated decision. You know, obviously, I have competition. Which is fine, because it keeps me sharp, but, you know, usually I'll lose out on a guy just because of proximity, because somebody at the store might be a little closer. But I've had plenty of guys come in from Summit County, Cuyahoga County, Portage County, because they go, oh, you got nice stuff here. They might, might be a weekly customer, but they'll come in every two, three, four months. And if you know they're coming in from Cleveland every three or four months, they're not coming empty-handed. They're going to spend some money, so... That what sometimes takes a good Saturday to a great Saturday because some guy will come in and buy a three, four, five hundred dollar comic or some other comic books. But you know, man, comic book store cannot let you know live by new comics alone. No, that's one of these I actually said at the last uh, thing. I, I go if you have a store and you're just relying on new books to, to cover your nut, you're done. <laughs> I have, a, I have a star up by me that kind of does that, and, mm-hmm. and he's done well. He's been open, you know, twenty some years, but he doesn't do conventions. You know, they I guess they do some eBay stuff here and there. They do some eBay, but other than that, they don't do with toys. It's just strictly comics and new right. comics and uh, back issues. I mean, they, that'll only take you so far. It really can, you yeah. know, especially in these times. You know, I, I, I'm blessed because I do have books that are. Four figures and five figures. So if I need to sell one of my two Hulk number ones, if it ever came to that, I can. But I don't want to. <laughs> and I don't, you know, again, it's, if I don't need to, then I'm not going to. So that'll be the last bastion of, you know, desperation if you see me porking a Hulk one on <laughs> eBay or Comic Link or something like that. You know, any of my, you know, older, more expensive books. That's a, that's one of your favorites, huh? The, that's your. Hawks, my guy, oh, always really? has been. Yeah, my brother was a big Fantastic Four fan growing up, and I was a Hulk fan. So, 
we would, he's only 18 months younger than I am, so when we went comic shop hunting, we'd always have lists. Now, you collect this guy, and I'll collect this guy, you know. My brother, he lives in Stowe now, but, you know, he's probably set foot in the store here maybe five times in the last 10 years. You know, he just. Not in grow out? And, yeah. You know. He still thinks it's like childish, and I'm like, dude. Even back in the 70s, these companies are owned by adults. It's not a bunch of 12-year-old kids running this stuff. This is a <laughs> legitimate business. It's like, I don't play D&D anymore, and I don't watch this stuff anymore. And I'm like, you want to turn into a crotchety old man that, you know, go ahead. I, I still hope, you know, I still live like I did when I was 16, a little more, a little smarter than it was and a little more uh, disciplined, but... I ain't changing my life for anything, for anybody. <laughs> I tell people, I go to bed with a smile on my face, I wake up with a smile on my face. 